Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Florida Friendly Landscapes, Good Enough to Eat. This is going to be um, kind of, it's new for me. It's not new for Dr. Lester, who's joining us this morning. He talks about edible crops all the time, but it's only in recent, um, in the past couple of years, where Florida Friendly Landscaping and Edible Landscaping have kind of joined together. Um, I guess because it wasn't considered low maintenance or, you know, all of that before they, um, Florida Friendly didn't really address it. But then they hired a lot of Florida Friendly um, agents who knew a lot about vegetables and fruits and knew how to grow them in a Florida Friendly manner. So now, you know, the, those two factions are coming together. So we're going to talk about incorporating edibles into your Florida friendly landscape. And there's a wonderful uh, publication on this. And I mean, this, this presentation is based very much on that publication. So if you want to um, find it, you can Google bait. It's edible landscaping using the nine Florida friendly landscaping principles. And there's a whole bunch of Florida friendly um, agents throughout the state who contributed to that publication. Um, and also, Dr. Lester was generous enough to share an older publication with me so that some of the photos we, we've taken from that one too. And um, in case I didn't do so on the recording, I would like to welcome Dr. Lester from Hernando County IFIS Extension Office um, joining us today. Welcome, Bill. Good morning, Lily. How are you doing? I'm just great. I think we're going to enjoy this one because it's a lot of really good information and some really nice pictures, too. This is Florida Friendly Landscaping, and this is um, this is our emails at the end here. So these are the nine principles of the Florida friendly landscaping. And we're gonna cover each of them. We're gonna go through each of these nine principles and talk about how that relates to bringing edible crops into your Florida friendly landscape. As always, I will um, provide a PDF of this program to you if you are interested. So, if you are interested, email me. There's my email down there, lilyb at hernandocounty.us. Two L's in Lily, in the middle of Lily. Three L's in Lily, actually. Um, so I keep admitting more people. Um, welcome, everybody. And also, here is Dr. Lester's email beside mine. If you have specific vegetable type questions, fruit type questions, edible gardening type questions, email Dr. Lester, because all I'm going to do is forward your email <laughs> to Dr. Lester, because he knows a whole lot more about the specifics of that than I do. I just know about the basics of Florida friendly landscaping. So we're together, we're going to, we're going to meet and see how those two things can work well together. And I will start with right plant, right place. That's number one. And that applies to any type of plants. It also applies to right time. It should say right timing as well. Move some of these little boxes I have out of my way here. Um, we are different timing than up north. If you've just moved here from up north and you have always done your vegetable gardens at certain times, let me tell you now, wipe your mind of that. We have pretty much three growing seasons, right, Dr. Lester? Pretty much. Two warm well, we, seasons. And, all year yeah, and a, growing season. You can grow things year round here in Central Florida. Well, yes, three main ones, two warm seasons and a cool season. We mm -hmm. do have a hot season. And um, I have on another slide, the things you can grow in the hot season, but it's not the things you're used to growing in June, July and August up North. The best tool you should go to right away if you are thinking about growing vegetables in Florida is Google Florida Vegetable Gardening Gu Guide UF. That has a 
um, a chart with dates and times for central, north, south Florida, what you should plant when, how you should all go about it. You also want to give varieties for right plant, right place. Make sure they grow well in Florida. You know, Dr. Lester can tell you about different tomatoes that do well in Florida, but maybe your old ones that you've always had, they're just not going to be as happy here. And that goes for a lot of different varieties. Make sure it's going to do okay to grow in Florida. Otherwise, you're going to be very frustrated with the whole process. Also, if you're looking at your yard, um, there are many different ways to do it. But you want to choose an area of your yard that has, you know, already the conditions that would be great. I mean, you can amend the soil and everything, but if you're going to start at really hard, compacted, sandy, nothing soil, you're going to make yourself a lot harder. <laughs> you know, if there are areas in your yard that also get the appropriate amount of sun um, that has a little bit better soil, you're, you're just going to do better there. Um, and also in any of these, it's not always, um, we're, we're talking today about how to fit it into your landscape, but the same thing with right plant, right place with ornamental plants goes with vegetables. You may want it aesthetically over here to please you, but that might not please the plant. And if you're gonna have a successful plant, you're gonna have to put it in the conditions where it can thrive. Do you know this picture, Dr. Lester? Mm -hmm. is <laughs> no, that you, you? no, oh no. Okay. <laughs> this is Mrs. Strickland uh, picking blackberries. Oh, okay. uh, Bill's former boss's wife there. It was quite a while ago. <laughs> I found that on your um your PowerPoint that you sent me. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that is an older PowerPoint. <laughs> yes. Um, also, um, you know, what would make things easier? You you can plant what you want, but what will make things easier in your life, and I'll be a, even a little more Florida friendly and low maintenance is to focus on perennials that are gonna come back by themselves. Um, you know, there's nothing at all wrong with your annual vegetable garden, but if you can get different things that self seed that are edible that come back on their own, you know, so much the better. Here are, we mentioned the summer months, and I'm just putting this in here because it is it's a different situation than it is up north. You're not going to really have, you know, you're not gonna run out in July and be picking your tomatoes like you are up north. You'll be picking them, but they'll be full of every disease and insect that can, you can imagine. So the only things that grow in the heat, heat, heat of our hot summers are the three basics are black eyed peas, sweet potatoes, and okra. And every time I mention that, I make you know people think a little bit. When you hear those three things, what do you think of? What do you think of, Doctor Lester? Tropical. Yeah, so I think of southern food. Parts of the world. Southern food. Mm -hmm. And that really it makes sense because it's what they had to eat. <laughs> so, you know, when they had to plant all their food. Also, then they threw in um, these more tropical things. So we've expanded our summer palette to this malanga. Dr. Lester will even have to tell you what that is. I'm not even sure. Um, yucca, pigeon peas, Malabar spinach, hot peppers, roselle. Roselle's a lot of fun. It's like a um, cranberry hibiscus is its other name. Another um, thing you can think about if you want to be Florida friendly is also drought tolerant. So you're not using a lot of um, water on these things. And here are some of the drought tolerant um, edibles that you can grow in your yard. Lemongrass, rosemary, loquats, and persimmons. And if you have questions, just go ahead and put it in the end, or in the end, in the chat. And at the end, We'll try to get to them. Dr. Lester may have to run off. So maybe Dr. Lester, while I'm talking, you can keep track of the chat um, so that you can get some of these questions answered that people might have on specifics. 
And sure. also I avoid I put a link up to the uh, University of Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. Yes. Um, avoid invasive plants. And I would also, and I think both of us agree on avoid the latest trends, you know, the latest superfood, whatever that might happen to be. If it's not known how well it grows here, or if it goes, you know, becomes aggressive and invasive, hold off a little bit and see what happens with those things. Don't always fall for the latest thing that's going to solve all of your problems, which, you know, I'm not going to mention any specific names. It might be a tree that starts with an M right now, but, <laughs> or another kind of bush that starts with an M as well. But <laughs> just um, be careful out there and, you know, go with the old standards until we're, we know how some of these new superfoods are gonna work out in our yards and everywhere else. All right, number two is Dr. Lester with watering efficiently. Okay, watering, uh, and this would be primarily for a vegetable garden, although it would apply to fruit trees and really everything in your yard. You need to observe the plants for signs of water stress. So different plants are gonna need different amounts of water. You're gonna to have to irrigate your lawn a little bit differently than you do your hedge bushes and differently from how you do in a vegetable garden. It depends a lot on the time of year and the weather, whether we're getting any regular rain or not. So for example, right now, for anybody who has a vegetable garden, you're gonna to have to go out there and water it every single day because right now it is a beautiful sunny day outside. It's been warm, it's been windy. And all that makes the plants go through more water and vegetable plants, because if you have your spring garden just put in, your plants are still very small. They're going to dry out quicker than they would if when the tomatoes are, you know, fully grown. So watch this plant for signs of water stress. Now, I know that when it comes to your lawn, we have just once a week irrigation. And that's true. Your lawn will get by just fine only being watered once a week. But for something like a vegetable garden, you may have to go out there with a garden hose and stand there and manually water it. Same thing with your um, flowers and other plants that you have in the landscape in your flower beds. And when we get to it a little bit later on, if you have any edibles tucked into those flower beds, they're gonna need extra water that you can provide with a garden hose or a watering can or something like that. The once a week irrigation does not apply to that. Once a week right. irrigation applies to the in-ground automatic systems that have a box in your garage and you throw the switch on and they come on and they water your whole yard. Uh, you can use a rain gauge or if you don't have a rain gauge, uh, empty tuna fish can or cat food can is gonna work also. And that is a good way to monitor rainfall and adjust irrigation. I had somebody earlier today ask me, he had just put in a little um, sprinkler system in his vegetable garden. He said, how long do I water it for? That depends. Depends on the sprinkler heads, how many heads you have, the water pressure, a lot of things. What you want to do is measure and water your vegetable garden. So you put down between a half an inch and three quarters of an inch each time you water it. More water than that, and you're just wasting water. You're pushing the fertilizer beyond the plant's roots. Anything less than that, you're probably not giving the plants enough water. So use a rain gauge or some other kind of container to um, monitor how much rainfall you've gotten and to adjust your irrigation timing. Uh, like I said, you can hand water, you can use micro irrigation. This picture here is uh, drip irrigation, which works very, very well in vegetable gardens. If you go to a lawn and garden store, there's all kinds of different setups and companies with the different little micro irrigation heads, they all work really, really well to conserve water. Hydrozones is where you try to group plants together that have similar water needs. So in your landscape, a really good example is something like impatience and azaleas. They're little water hogs. They need really, really regular water. So you don't wanna mix them with really drought tolerant plants because when do you water them extra? Do you water them less because it's drought tolerant? You don't know how much water to give them to make them all happy if they're all mixed together. So if you mix plant, if you put plants that need extra water together and then other drought tolerant plants together, 
you can fine tune the irrigation to make your plants happy and healthy. And then remember that any kind of seedlings you have, so if you just planted your vegetable garden and the plants are just coming up, they're still really, really tiny, they're gonna need extra water because they don't have much of a root system yet and they're gonna dry out a lot faster. So they might need even just a quick spray from your garden hose to keep them moist a couple times a day if you can do that. I know that I can't because when I'm working during the day, I can't get out there and water them. But um, seedlings are definitely going to need some extra water. So next slide. So always try to water at the base of the plants, and that applies to everything. You really want to try to just water the plant's roots. You don't need to get the leaves and the stems wet. You don't need to get the weeds in the walkways or the rest of your garden wet. Just try to water just the plant at the base of the plant. Water your plants early in the morning because that way the sun is going to come up and dry the leaves off because wet leaves, especially if they're wet all night long, is really, really bad for promoting fungal diseases. Fungal diseases really, really like wet leaves all night. So if you water it in the morning, the leaves dry off, you're going to have far fewer problems with diseases in your garden. Now, if you're growing anything in a container, um, so you can select them with water reservoirs. And I think that we might have somebody with mosquito control on here. No, oh, um, I don't think she made it. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, I can mention that if you're using containers, you can use the containers that have a little built-in water reservoir at the bottom, but you're going to need to keep an eye on that because that can be an ideal place for mosquitoes to lay their eggs and make more mosquitoes and it's kind of hidden from you because the pot sits on top of it. And now you're raising a huge crop of mosquitoes in your backyard and you don't even know it. So you need to check those reservoirs and try to take a garden hose and blast all the water out and clean it out. And if there are any mosquito larvae in there, blast them out in the middle of your lawn. They're gonna die if you do that to help reduce uh, the incidence of you raising mosquitoes because nobody wants you want to raise healthy plants, you don't want to be raising mosquitoes in your garden. And for the few people in Hernando County, and I know in other counties, this varies quite a bit, if you are on reclaimed water, which is um, very, very important and worthwhile for watering lawns with, that is not recommended for drinking, number one, or for watering your edible crops with. And this you have to use a little bit of common sense. You know, can I use reclaimed water to uh, water my loquat tree? Probably. You know, if there's no loquats on it and the water is just hitting at ground level and just watering the roots of that tree, that's probably safe. Can I use reclaimed water for uh, watering my lettuce that only gets maybe six inches tall in my vegetable garden? No, because the reclaimed water is going to get all over the leaves and reclaimed water varies a lot in exactly how clean it is and what's in it. And it's just not recommended and not safe for most edible crops. So if you're in question about it, just don't use the reclaimed water on anything that you're going to eat. That's that's the safest recommendation we have for you. It yes. also has varying levels of nitrogen, which you don't know. And you might want, you know, you could with that and your fertilizer be over fertilizing your crops. As well. Sure. If you have reclaimed water and you're watering even just, just your lawn with it, contact us because you do the reclaimed water technically has nutrients in it and you need to subtract that from how much fertilizer you give your plants. Otherwise, you may over fertilize them with certain nutrients and throw things out of whack. So it's complicated. Just it go is. ahead and get a hold of us if you have questions about that. So fertilizing appropriately. Uh, very important if you have a vegetable garden that you amend the soil with compost or other organic matter. And of course, the best way to do this is to make your own compost. But if you don't have a compost bin and you don't want to make your own compost, you can purchase bags of black cow cow manure, other um, soil amendments at big box stores. Uh, mushroom compost is available by the bag at the stores. Uh, that you can work in the soil to build up your sandy soil. It's going to help to hold the water better and hold the fertilizer nutrients better. You want to follow specific fertilization recommendations for each crop and always follow the label. 
as a general rule, and this is just a very general rule for vegetables and even uh, different small fruit and fruit tree crops, vegetables like to be fertilized on a pretty regular basis, but very lightly. So think more often, but very lightly. They like a nice steady supply of nutrients. For other things in your yard, if you have citrus, use a quality citrus fertilizer. It has all the micronutrients that your citrus trees need. There are other fertilizers that are labeled for mangoes and avocados. Go ahead and use them because they're formulated to have the right micronutrients. Many other tree crops, once they get established and a little bit larger, don't need a whole lot of fertilizer, but for each specific crop you have, University of Florida has a specific fact sheet on it and it does include what kind of fertilizer to use, how often does this crop like a lot of fertilizer, very little fertilizer, a lot of nitrogen, not so much. So it's different for each different crop. It's really hard for us to give a blanket statement. Um, use a little common sense. Don't go out there and put down fertilizer on anything if you're gonna get a, a heavy thunderstorm. If we have a hurricane coming, don't put down fertilizer right before the hurricane. It's going to wash away. You just wasted your time and money. And so it's a good idea to get an annual soil test. And you can contact our office for more information on that. That'll tell you the soil pH. And if it's appropriate for whatever you're trying to grow, whether it's a certain type of turf grass or garden plant or vegetable garden, uh, it tells you some of the different nutrient levels. So you know what you have to add and what the good Lord blessed your soil with naturally so you don't have to add it. So it's a really good starting spot. Like I said, contact our office. We, can, we have everything you need to order a soil test for your yard. Next well, slide. sometimes we don't have the soil the good Lord blessed us with. We have fill dirt that we are working with where our house was built and that's a whole, that you might need a whole lot of help. <laughs> We're just putting yeah, it that you way. never know exactly what you have until you get the soil tested. Yes. And most soil tests come back within a certain range, but we, I see some really, really unusual ones mm -hmm. from people from fill dirt because maybe it's a newer house and they brought in soil from who knows where and the soil has who knows what in it. And yeah, sometimes the results come back just really unusual. <laughs> so mulch, if you have a vegetable garden, it is a great idea that after you have your plants in and they're up and growing to put down some kind of mulch. It's going to help to block the weeds. It really helps a lot with holding the moisture in. You're not going to have to water it as often. It helps to regulate the temperature. Bare soil, when it's very, very sunny, the temperature can go up during the day and then drop a lot at night. Mulch helps to keep the temperature a little steadier, a little healthier for your plants and easier on the roots. But there's certain things that you really don't want to mulch vegetables with that maybe you use in other parts of your garden. So any kind of wood chips, and we don't recommend using cypress mulch because it's a non-renewable mulch source, but pine bark chips or the, the floor mulch and the other wood chip mulch, you don't want to use in a vegetable garden because that's really tough on the, uh, the plant stems. It could scrape them or cut them. And if you think about it, when this crop is done and you pull it up, what do you do with the wood chips in your garden? If you turn them under, they will break down in, oh, I don't know, three to five years would be my mm -hmm. guess. <laughs> not, not very quickly, but there are plenty of things that you can use as a mulch in a vegetable garden. I've always used grass clippings. If you um, have clean grass clippings in your yard and you bag them up, that's good for mulch. You can get a bale of hay, a bale of straw. You can get a bale of um, all the different things that you might find at um, the feed store to mulch with. Uh, what's something else? You can use pine, pine needles. needles. Pine yeah. needles, they're a little bit slower to break down, but they break down you know, definitely faster than wood chips. The nice thing about grass clippings and hay and straw is when your crop is done in a few months and you go to turn it under, that's just fine. Go ahead and turn those grass clippings and straw and hay under, and they're gonna break down in the soil very quickly. And you're basically adding compost bit by bit all the time 
as you're growing your crops. What about the leaves in our yard? Sure, that's another thing. If any kind of leaves that you might have, if you have oak trees and the leaves fall in the spring, that's a perfect time. If you have other deciduous trees like um, maple trees and things that drop their leaves in the fall, don't throw those leaves away. Either grind them up with a lawnmower and use them as mulch directly in your garden or grind them up and put them in your compost pile to compost and then work back in your garden. So all those leaves definitely need to one way or another find their way back into your garden to help build up the soil long term. And you do that for a couple of years and you will be amazed at just how nice your soil is going to look. It's not going to look like sand, beach sand anymore. Can we use compost as a mulch? Yes, you can. If you have compost and it's completely finished, you can just spread that on the surface of the soil to, to use it as a mulch. If it's not quite done, it's still a little chunky, there's still a little bit of stuff in there and it's not fully composted, once again, go ahead and just put it on the surface, use it as a mulch. It's going to break down surprisingly fast all on its own once it's out there in the garden. And what did you mean by clean grass clippings? Clean grass clippings would be grass clippings that were not sprayed with any kind of chemicals, whether it be herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. They are all different chemicals. Some of them break down very quickly and they're safety to incorporate into your garden. Other ones break down very slowly and they're gonna cause problems in your garden. So as a general rule, if, it's, if, you've used, if you've used sprays on your lawn or you have a service that sprays your lawn, you probably don't want to use those grass clippings unless you get an exact list of all the chemicals that were used and research all those chemicals and understand all their um, impacts and half-lives and everything else. It gets complicated. Yes, but if you do have a service or you do all that, um, just let the grass clippings go back into the lawn. It won't damage the lawn. There's no reason to bag that up and throw it away. It no, you never need to bag your grass clippings here in Central Florida and put them in a bag or trash can by the curb. Maybe in other states that you moved here from, that's what you did there. Here, you don't need to do it. It all breaks down year round very quickly. Okay, now it's my turn. Dr. Lester gets the green um, titles. I get the blue ones because he's plants and I'm water. See, that's how my <laughs> that's how my mind works there. Um, how does attract wildlife work together with planting a vegetable garden? So sometimes we feel that that's something we want to avoid. We think of you know the yearling. <laughs> that poor deer came and, you know, ate all his family's corn and, you know, um, it was a bad ending for that young boy's pet deer, but, or we might have um, issues with pest wildlife, but we do need wildlife in our vegetable garden because our things, our things are not going to grow without the pollinators. We want to find a way to attract the pollinators. A lot of times your plants that you have are growing, of course, are going to do that on their own. I mean, they're going to try to survive, but you can um, enhance that by bringing flowers and things in the same areas where you have a lot of these vegetable gardens. I just really love the idea of incorporating vegetables into your existing formal landscape. You know, I think that, you know, it's cool. Having a vegetable plot is one great way to go or having raised beds is one great way to go, but using the space you already have, I kind of really like that idea and being non-traditional. Who says that has to be filled up with ornamental plants? Possibly your HOA says that, but <laughs> you know, um, if you have a little bit more leeway, and a lot of these edible plants are quite attractive. So, you know, they, you might be able to do it if you have a deed restricted community as well. But mixing them together with a lot of wildflowers or other, um, you know, nectar and pollen producing plants that attracts, you don't want just the butterflies. The butterflies and the honeybees 
are the superstars of the pollinator world, but they're by no means the only ones out there. In fact, they couldn't survive without their host of um, supporting actors and you know craft for food service people and everyone who makes <laughs> the whole thing um, work together. The stunt insects and everybody. <laughs> we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of native um, bees here in Florida, hundreds of species of native bees. Also a whole lot of wasps and only a few of them um, are the ones that we have unpleasant encounters with and that sting us. Many of them are too tiny to do so and they're just staying out of their way, our way. Uh, flies even, moths, butterflies get all the attention when moths do you know, just as good of a job if not better hummingbirds and more. So how are we gonna attract these things to our yard? By planting a variety of different types of flowering plants or plants that otherwise attract um, these pollinators. But you also have to allow the beneficial insects. It's all part of the circle of life. Just because you see a bug does not mean you have to run out and get the spray and kill that bug. It may be a beneficial insect that is number one, um, taking care of our pest insects, which Dr. Lester is going to talk about insect control. They may be out there, you know, taking care of them for you, or they may be a food source for something that, you know, you want around that helps with pollination or pest control, such as birds. Um, toads can be a great, you know, food source for some of the birds that help us out. Bats are great pollinators. Anoles, everybody, not everybody, I, I, I should. We have run across a few people, right, Dr. Lester, who moved down here and don't like the lizards. And mm -hmm. we are like, what? <laughs> we both lived here more than 40 years. It's like saying, you know, you don't like the grass. I mean, it's just like, they're just there. And they are helpful in eating a lot of our pest insects. So let them be around. And um, a lot of people, when they start a vegetable or some kind of food crop, they, because it's built into us as humans is we want to really control everything. So we think the yard needs help with biological insects and we, send away for ladybugs or something like that. I know Dr. Lester feels like if you feed them, they will come. Our own natural to this area, beneficial insects will come and help you out for that. That's not an expense you need to um, have it by sending away for ladybugs from somewhere else or any other kind of biological help with that. And we will segue right in what to do about the problem um, insects and wildlife in our yard. Well, basically, it doesn't matter a whole lot what is printed on this slide. When you think that you have a problem in your garden, whether it be a vegetable garden or anywhere else in your yard with some kind of insect pest, you have to identify it correctly first. I see so many people and this is mostly on Facebook and other places where they start with asking, what can I get that's safe and organic and all natural that's going to, you know, control all my pests? The first thing I respond back with is, what are you having a problem with? And I get, I don't know. Uh, my plants don't look right. So there must be an insect on it, right? And my leaves are all eaten up, but I, ha I haven't bothered to look for exactly what's doing it. We can't give you any recommendations until we know what your problem is, or even if you have a problem. So not the number one most important thing is to properly identify your problem and also go out there and actually look at your plants, keep a close eye on them, go out in the afternoon and just look through your vegetable garden, turn over leaves and look for any kind of insect pests or disease problems and catch them very early on because then it's very easy for us to help you identify what it is. And many of these insect pests are very small. We have a microscope at the office. So, you know, 
we sent email with pictures, bring a sample by the office. We'll look at it under the microscope. We can tell you what you have or don't have very quickly and what you can use to help control it. Um, but you have to go out there and actually check your plants and catch the problems early. If you wait until your tomato plant is completely eaten up and all the leaves are gone and it's, you know, totally wiped out with the fungal disease, not a whole lot you can do to fix it at that point. You've got to catch these problems early. And then good sanitation in the garden does help. It helps to reduce diseases. So pick up the uh, any rotted fruit or you know tomatoes or anything else that's fallen off the plants, dead branches, uh, leaves that maybe had a, a leaf spot fungus on it. Don't leave them laying around in your vegetable garden because the fungal spores are going to go from those leaves to the unaffected plants now and help to spread the diseases from one thing to another. So sanitation is important. But really, the one thing that I probably stress the most on um, managing yard pests responsibly is figure out exactly what your problem is. If you tell, if we know what that is, we can go through the whole list of different various controls and steps that you can take. There is no magic silver bullet. And I know everybody loves neem oil online. You know, they think that neem is just gonna fix every single problem out there. No, it won't. You need to know what your problem is before you, we can help you figure out what the potential solutions are gonna be. And what is IPM? IPM is integrated pest management. And that is where you, that involves scouting for pests, that involves identifying the pests, that involves avoiding pests. One good way, if you have things in your yard that have, that you think have nonstop pest problems and you have to spray them or have your lawn service spray them and you're out there with a fungicide and insecticide every single week, you probably need to think about getting rid of that plant and growing something else. And a lot of times we'll find that those plants that have those problems don't do well in this area. Maybe it's something that you loved growing up north, it just is not gonna grow well here in Central Florida. So you need to reassess, are you really gonna to try to grow old tea roses and lavender and apple trees and things like that, that maybe did great up north, Ohio, you know, or wherever, they do not grow well down here. They're gonna be eaten up with pests and diseases. You're gonna to have to put a lot of pesticides on them and that doesn't do anybody any good. So integrated pest management is just a whole series of different steps that you take to manage your pest problems. So some things that can help with that, crop rotation. So don't grow the exact same type of vegetable in the exact same spot year after year after year after year you know, back to back growing tomatoes in the spring and tomatoes in the fall and tomatoes in the winter, all in the same spot, because the pests and diseases and things in the soil are gonna build up over time. If you have problems on your plants, sometimes just trimming off uh, dead leaves, spotted leaves, things like that, and throwing them in the trash is gonna help to reduce your problems. Biological control is things like ladybugs, and there's a whole host of other beneficial insects out there that help to eat your pest insects. So becoming familiar with <clears throat> what does an aphid look like? What does a mealybug look like? What do spider mites look like? You need to be able to identify them and knowing what a ladybug looks like. I think we probably all know what a ladybug looks like, but you know there's native Florida ladybugs that aren't orange with black spots like the stereotypical ladybug. They look a little bit different. They may have like be completely black and they gobble up aphids and mealybugs all, <clears throat> all, <clears throat> all day long and do a really good job with um, reducing the number of pests. So learning what the pest insects look like, learning what the beneficial ones look like is gonna make you better informed on do I need to spray an insecticide or do I need to tell my lawn guy or service to spray an insecticide? Oh, and we yeah, also the ladybug babies look completely different than the ladybugs and they look kind of scary. I, I wish I had a picture here, but you can Google ladybug larvae. It might be something that you would be like, oh, oh, this must be bad. No, nope, it's a baby ladybug. <laughs> Sure, education is important. If you look online 
and look up University of Florida Beneficial Insects. They do have fact sheets that have all the most common ones and pictures and educating yourself about what is actually out in your garden here in Florida is very, very helpful for you to identify what your problem is and figuring out, is it even a problem? Do I need to spray? And then we get questions, that last little point there about um, uh, pest wildlife. They're all different. If you need information on moles or gophers or deer or rabbits or things like that, you're probably going to have to just exclude them with fencing from your garden. So contact our office. And once again, University of Florida has information online about all those different things. So if you do need to use a... Um, pest control because you do have an outbreak of this picture here is a southern green stink bug or leaf footed bugs or aphids or mealy bugs or whatever the case may be. Number one, you have to identify it and figure out what the problem is. Number two, we can recommend specific things that are going to control them. And we always start with recommending the least toxic product that's still going to be effective. And don't think that neem oil is going to fix everything and kill everything. It works well on a certain set of pests. Other pests, it does not work at all. And you're just wasting your time and wasting your spray. Uh, so the recommendations that we'll give you, I always start with the least toxic. And as a general rule, rule things like insecticidal soap, uh, BT for caterpillars, and maybe one or two other things is really all you're going to need to control 99% of your problems out there. So those are all, if we know what your pest problem is, we can recommend the correct control for it. Okay, the next one is um, uh, recycle yard waste. That's one of the principles. And um, Bill touched on compost when he talked about fertilizer, because that is really one of the the best ways to fertilize your vegetable garden is to utilize compost. Start yourself a compost um, pile or get a compost bin. There are many different ways you can do that. And it's really beneficial for your vegetable garden. Use your kitchen scraps um, in your compost. Um, you can use anything except any animal related product with one exception, and that is eggshells. <laughs> Now, eggshells are purely calcium, so they're never really going to break down. They just kind of help add to the um, structure of your compost. So you might not want to throw like whole eggshells in there, um, kind of break them up to do that. But that, you know, adding that calcium to your vegetable garden is very helpful as well. You can even compost paper. You can, it's help, helpful, obviously, if you shred it up. Um, just plain white paper, as Dr. Lester always mentioned, if you um, shred up your envelopes, get that little plastic window out of there or that little, those little pieces of plastic will be there way longer than we will be on earth. <laughs> um, any leaves, yard waste, as long as they have not been treated with anything or are not diseased, because that's not something you wanna pass on to your vegetable garden. As I said, no animal products. Um, no diseased plants, you're just gonna keep passing on issues or chemically treated plants. Um, he mentioned that with the grass to use as mulch. And so Dr. Lester, when it comes to compost, we have a question here for you. Yeah, for anybody who's um, making their own compost and you wanna use animal manure or you wanna use animal manure in your garden, That'd be like horse manure, cow manure, chicken, uh, goats, or whatever animal it may have come from. If you're using that around any kind of edible plants or edible crops, there could be problems with um, food safety. So I'm sure everybody's heard in the past about um, different food safety problems and vegetable recalls and outbreaks of salmonella and E. coli those could be present in any kind of animal manure. So animal manure needs to be composted and handled correctly before it can be safely used in a uh, 
either vegetable garden or around any other kind of edible crops. Now, if you're using it around, let's say your azaleas or you compost chicken manure and you mulch your palm trees with it, that's fine. You're not eating your azaleas or your palm trees. Uh, you need to wash your hands really well and, you know, um, don't, you know, get sick or pick up anything that way. But if you want to make your own compost and you want to use animal manure, you need to contact us because there are specific steps you need to take when you're composting it to make sure it's safe for you and your family to use around in a vegetable garden or around small fruit crops like blueberries, blackberries, something like that. Also, even if you're putting it on ornamental um, crops, you don't want to just plop it there. You want, you want, cause it's all again, very high in nitrogen. So let it, um, let it sit a while and compost. Well, we usually say this is for ornamental plants, not for vegetables or fruit. Um, that it, when it no longer smells like what it is, it's fairly safe on your ornamentals. It won't be too strong for them. So when it comes to manure, here's picture Dr. Lester just got taken yesterday, um, taking precautions when it comes to using manure in compost. And we're not kidding. I'll, I'll see his little. Yeah, we had kid. some one week old baby goats visit the office yesterday and Yes, they were very, very cute and very, very well behaved too. They're really, they're really sweet when they're only a week old. <laughs> All right, uh, now reducing stormwater runoff. That is, you know, it's a Florida friendly principle and it's important with all aspects of your yard. Now, just as Dr. Lester mentioned about reclaimed water is not recommended for your vegetable crops. I'm the rain barrel lady. That's what I'm called around the county, the rain barrel lady. I do not recommend the use of rain barrel water on your edible crops. Again, as Dr. Lester mentioned, a loquat tree, citrus tree, you know, something where it's just going to the roots will probably be okay. Um, you may think, well, well, what sense does that make? It rains on my garden. Yes, it does. The rain barrel is collecting rain from your roof. And so lots of things poop on your roof, as well as they, then going through the gutters. And there's, um, you know, your roof has heavy metals and um, things such as that. So whereas it's fine for ornamental, uh, ornamental plants around your yard, I do not feel comfortable recommending that you put the rain barrel water on your uh, vegetable garden or low growing fruit, anything like that. It again is by no means potable water. But when you're building your, um, your vegetable gardens and things like that, use permeable materials for the walkways around it. That allows the water to seep through instead of running off and going down the street and collecting um, different pollutants. And also, you know, if you're thinking of building a specific area, construct berms and swales, which will direct the water that might come off your house or may come from various places around your yard and direct it to, you know, where it kind of filters into your garden as well. So you don't um, lose any of that. Be almost like a vegetable rain garden in a, in a way. And protecting the waterfront, that's um, principle number nine. If you, all of these things that we have mentioned protect all of our fragile waterfronts in Florida, because we all live near some body of water somewhere. We could all walk to a body of water. I'm sure we could. But also we all live on the water because we all live on the aquifer. And that's also what we're trying to protect that our groundwater as well. But if you literally live on a body of water, um, you don't want to put your vegetables or anything that requires tilling, irrigation, or fertilization within 10 feet of your body of water. The best thing you can do there is that's the perfect place to put those wild flowers and other pollinator attractors. So that's going to be a no chemical zone. That's gonna protect the water. It's also gonna attract those pollinators to your garden. So it's kind of a win-win situation there. 
All right, Dr. Lester, I'll let you cover how, how we're gonna get started with this vegetable garden here. Sure, well, first you need to figure out what your goals are and mostly goals and limitations. So your limitations would obviously be, uh, you know, everybody watching here today, I'm sure some of you live in a, a subdivision with the homeowners association and there are certain rules that you have to follow and things that if you push the rules a little too much, you're going to get called on that. Now there are, are ways that you can tuck and we're going to show pictures and talk a little bit about how to tuck edibles into more traditional landscaping that you would see in the HOA. And, uh, you know, that maybe the HOA committee is when they drive through the neighborhood. Uh, obviously, if you plow up your front yard and plant corn, they will question that. <laughs> um, others probably live further out in the country and maybe you have a piece of property, you know, a number of acres and you want to start more of a food forest. You're going to be limited by exactly where you live and exactly what's going to grow well there. So for any of you who are in Hernando County in Central Florida, there's plenty of things that grow really well here. Apple trees are not one of them. Pear trees generally are not one of them. They get a really bad disease here in Florida. That's why you don't go to see any commercial pear production in Florida. Um, other things grow really well in South Florida, all the wonderful tropical fruits. They're not gonna do well here unless you keep them warm because they can freeze and die when it gets 27 degrees the day after Christmas like it did here. So um, you need to figure out what your limitations are and what your, your, the possibilities that you can do that fit within your limitations, figure out what your goals are. Do you wanna grow uh, some herb plants so that you have small amounts of fresh grown herbs to incorporate into your dinner? Do you wanna um, grow certain things, large amounts of certain things so that you can can them or dry them or freeze them or whatever? in which case you'd have, you put in a vegetable garden and plant the whole thing in beans for the spring and get a whole, whole ton of beans because you really like them and you can freeze them and can them. You wanna grow a little bit of different things for your family to be able to enjoy. Um, you're also limited a little bit by your soil, but there's ways around that. You could build the soil up, you could purchase bagged amendments, you can make your own compost. We've already mentioned about how that builds your soil up and really benefits it. The plants are gonna grow much better. And then make up a list of what you want to grow and then make sure that those are all things that can grow here. And like Lily said at the very beginning about the right plant in the right place, you have to do it at the right time also. The biggest mistakes and problems I see with new gardeners here in Central Florida is they're growing things that'll grow great here, but they grow at the time, right, wrong time of year. So for people who are thinking about plant in, who live in Hernando County, that are gonna plant carrots right now, don't do it. Wait till September. You should have planted them back in September and October. They grow great all winter long. Pretty soon when it gets a little bit warmer and the days get a little bit longer, all your cool season things are gonna take a nosedive. Carrots are gonna, not taste as good, they're not gonna look very good. Lettuce, collards, mustards, everything else is gonna take a nosedive. We have all the different resources and lists. Get, download that vegetable gardening guide. Has a really good chart of all the different things you can grow here in Florida and follow the little column for Central Florida or if you're in North Florida, the North Florida column or South Florida, same thing, and see when to plant things and follow that. If you plant things that are going to grow well here at the right time, that's, gosh, that's like 90% of your challenge right there. Mm -hmm. Don't think insects are the biggest problem because we can identify them. And if you catch them early, you can, you can deal with insects. That's not a big problem. Now you're about 98% of the way there to being successful with actually growing these things. So... Look into the different crops that are on your list to make sure uh, University of Florida has a fact sheet on every different thing imaginable out there. Go ahead and pull that up. And if you want to grow cauliflower next winter, become a cauliflower expert and you can grow cauliflower here. I've grown it before. Broccoli is surprisingly easy. I have a bunch in my garden right now. So it's not that difficult. Now here we're going to 
buzz through a bunch of different pictures here that will hopefully stimulate your creativity to go out there and create these things in your garden. Don't think you have to do them exactly the way they are in the picture. This is intended to kind of spark your own ideas based mm -hmm. on where you live, what you have. You live in an HOA, you live on 10 acres, you have flower beds, you have hanging baskets. What can you do to grow more edible things as opposed to just decorative landscape kind of plants? Because you know, you can't eat the viburnums. Mm -hmm. Everybody seems to have viburnums and everybody has all flower beds filled with those green bushes that you got to pay your long guy to trim all the time. You can't eat them, but there are things that you can put in that you can eat. So a kitchen garden, and here's a picture of a really attractive um, raised bed type garden, and they have a variety of things growing at the right time of year that you could pick and take straight into your kitchen and work in a dinner. Um, here's a landscape bed with a tomato plant growing in it. And if you do it correctly, you can sneak tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, other vegetables that look attractive into your otherwise just decorative landscape beds and actually grow something that hopefully you're going to get a uh, harvest off of and be able to eat. Like I said, you can't eat the viburnums. Here's a squash plant and squash turns into a very attractive plant when it flowers, it gets very large yellow uh, flowers on it. And it's actually mixed in with marigold. So you can mix and match these different things to keep it looking attractive, but sneak some edibles in there also. Hanging baskets. A lot of people have hanging baskets around the yard. Uh, you know, there are a, and I just attended an in-service training about a month ago. There's a huge number of varieties of tomatoes and peppers that are bred to be small plants, but get a lot of tomatoes on them, like the picture in the middle here. Those are cherry tomatoes. There's a bunch of them on there, but it's a naturally small plant. It doesn't grow really, really large. And a lot of these are specifically bred now to be put in hanging baskets. So tomatoes, hot peppers, lettuce, kale, all of them can look good in hanging baskets. There are ideas, and I'm no expert on this, but if you look online, there are trellis systems and systems that you can make out of wood, maybe even old pallets that you put on a wall and you attach pots to it. And when everything grows in and fills in, it looks like it's cascading down the wall. Fill it with edibles, fill it. Mm -hmm. I can see that looks like parsley growing on there. That looks like maybe some kind of hot pepper that's lettuce there. So those are all edible plants on that. Um, I don't even know what you want to call it. That, that vertical, wall. vertical wall. gardening. Yeah. It's not an S, it's not one of those SP layer things, but it's, it's. No, espaliers Espalier. is different. That's how you manage a fruit tree. Okay, yes. Uh, a couple years ago, those topsy-turvy pots were very popular. That's a pot that you hang up high and grow a tomato plant where it grows out of a hole in the bottom of the pot. And the tomato, instead of planting it in the ground and growing up, it's in a pot up high and it grows down. And can look very attractive. This picture right here, that looks, wow, I wish that was in my backyard. I've got a bunch <laughs> yes. of tomatoes on it. And if you keep it cleaned up, and manage it correctly and use a fungicide for diseases, yours could look just as attractive as that. And I, I wouldn't think that my, you know, somebody's HOA would no. yell at them too much about that. But containers, there's a huge number of different combinations you could put together in a container. The one on the left has uh, red leaf lettuce in the center and looks like a, a petunias. Pansies. Yeah, those are pansies around. Yeah. <laughs> and there are different varieties of plants, flowering plants where you can eat the flowers. Uh, yeah. University of Florida has a lot of information on edible flowers. So if you tie them together in one pot, the whole thing is edible. On the right is a traditional strawberry pot. 
And strawberries, you, if you plant them in October here in Central Florida, like the commercial guys do, you can have tons of strawberries right now. And they're going to last for another month or two before they start to decline with the heat. And these are rather traditional containers here. You can go crazy with container. Anything that fits soil and has some drainage, you can grow. You can grow whatever in just about. Sure. There is a whole art and science to containers with a upright plant in the center, other plants, and then around the edge, ones that are going to trail over the edge. And just play with it. Just play with it. And Drillers, fillers, and spillers. Exactly. Yep, that's it. <laughs> yeah. That's how to make a proper attractive container. Right, right. But you could grow them in, um, sometimes they grow them in plastic bags, you know, or all they kind of. grow bags. But yeah. the nice thing about these containers is if you look at the stores now, they have a lot of containers that are very large, but they're not made out of clay, so they don't weigh right, 100 right. pounds. They weigh only five pounds. And if you put together a nice container, you can put it by your front door, you can put it out in the front yard, and mm -hmm. you're gonna have one of the prettiest yards in the neighborhood, along with being able to pick things out of it and take them inside and eat them. So we can grow all different herbs here in Florida. Let's see, the only ones that don't do well here is lavender. Please don't try growing lavender in Florida. It's gonna be, it's, it's a steep hill to climb. And I know that there's probably somebody watching today that's going to, you know, put in the chat box, well, I'm able to grow it. Well, very, very few people are successfully. It's mostly uh, disappointment. Yeah. But basil and bay and mint and tarragon and rosemary and sage and oregano and Cuban oregano, there's a lot of different varieties. And we do entire classes on growing herbs. If you visit our Facebook page, we have classes we've done, several classes we've done in the past that are all recorded. Uh, if you look under videos on Facebook, it's all in there. And that photo back there, that is rosemary. That's a rosemary hedge. Yeah, you could grow an entire hedge out of rosemary. Mm -hmm. That's going to give you more rosemary than you and all your neighbors can use in a lifetime. But it would smell wonderful. Oh, yeah, it yeah. will. Here's the warm season vegetables. Um, well, you can here's, go ahead and talk about list. them. Here's a whole list of what you should be planning on putting in the ground now, today, this weekend, as soon as you get a chance. You don't want to wait too long to get them in. You need to get them in very, very soon if you want to be successful with all these. And here's a lady growing corn, and she literally pointed out she's probably growing, or she is growing it up north. Was that in Pennsylvania? Yes. So the there, the basement they, gives it away. <laughs> up there, they say your corn should be knee high by July. Here in Florida, your corn should be long gone by July. Long gone. It ain't going to grow well in July here. You'll grow a bumper crop of caterpillars and dead corn plants, but corn needs to be planted in Florida today, really, really soon. It, but yeah, but this also, spring. this shows that um, they put it in, you know, a typical um, bed right next to the house where you would normally put ornamentals and they filled it up with corn. So, you know, why not? Yeah. Sure. That's the kind of thing that an HOA may question. And it depends on your HOA. I'm just saying that. Right, right, right. But if you don't live in an example, HOA. Yeah. Corn is a painfully obvious vegetable when put in a front yard flower bed. Other things can be tucked away and hidden. You know, six eggplant plants, which are going to give you more than enough eggplant that you could ever possibly eat, can look attractive and be tucked into your uh, front flower bed. They're pretty inconspicuous. If you fill it with corn, mm, that's going to stand out. Yeah. There you go, Dr. Lester. Talk about those um, uncommon edibles that are becoming more popular. Sure, there are plenty of things that can be grown here in Central Florida. Prickly pear, which I've never tried eating, and you want to get the right variety. To Prickly pear, none of it is poisonous. 
it's just I would think this the wrong prickly pear is going to taste really awful. Well, you have to be careful that's, handling it too. Yeah, because that that's a cactus, and it's yeah. the cactus that gets the big flower and the big fruit on it. Many of them are edible, but some of them are going to taste really awful. So not all of them are very tasty. And yes, be very, very, very careful handling them because even if you don't see the thorns, they have these like invisible hairs that are very painful. Yeah, yeah. For all I know these, what you're doing with that. For all these, pull up the University of Florida fact sheet and it'll tell you everything that you need to know on basics. And then if you need to know more, go ahead and contact us directly. But you can grow things like prickly pear and figs, blackberries, certain varieties of blackberries, the northern varieties aren't going to do well. There's right. an ornamental palm that you may have in your yard right now, a pindo palm, and they can fl they flower and they get an actual edible fruit. All the other palms, when they flower and they get the little fruits or little nuts or seeds or berries, whatever you want to call them, they're not edible. Pindo palm is an exception. It is edible. It's called a jelly palm. Yeah, it's also called a jelly palm. You could make it into jelly. Um, mulberry, there are certain mulberries that you can grow and eat, the red and black one. The white mulberry is a really bad invasive, so you want to avoid that one. Persimmon, there are wild persimmons that grow here in Florida and domesticated ones. Some of them grow really well and taste very good if you get the right variety. <clears throat> pineapple, that, that the picture is right here is pineapple. And that's a pretty de decorative looking border plant. Start putting in pineapples and eventually it will get a pineapple. May take 10 months, may take a year or two. All you have to protect them. The <clears throat> but it can get, it will, it will one day get a pineapple. You may have to be very patient. Some for some now, can't you do that just by putting in the top of your pineapple that you got from the store? Yep. And then passion fruit which is an attractive vine. And some varieties get a lot of fruit. Other varieties get just a little bit of fruit. Some varieties taste good. Other varieties are edible, but not as tasty. And University of Florida puts out these really great um, infographics. And if you follow our Facebook page, our um, office assistant, Teresa, is very, very good at posting these the first of the month. And in this infographic here, you see all the different edibles that you can plant in March. And it's broken up by North Florida, Central, and South Florida because they are all different. Jacksonville is not like Orlando and not like Miami. You're growing very different things at very different times of the year. So all these things are, are site specific. Mm -hmm. So here's another one of all the different edibles that you can plant in April. So follow our Facebook page and follow these. It's just a really good visual one page to kind of keep you, oh, Central Florida. Let's see, April's coming up. What is this? It's March 10th. Yeah, April's in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. So here in Central Florida, um, Chinese cabbage, I think it's a little late for that. Sweet potatoes, you want to put them in in April. Uh, you want to plant beans, you can plant beans right now. You can put in corn right now. You can still do it in April. Southern peas, which is black eyed peas. So follow this guide. It's a really good guide to go along with the link that we put in the chat box earlier for the vegetable gardening guide. If you have the two of them, that's going to get you about 80% of the way there. Okay, I see that you answered a lot of these chat questions already. Yeah, I was trying to do that and keep up with you at the same time. So. Okay, you're pretty good at that. You are pretty uh, and good I didn't multitasker. Moment, but and every time I mention lavender, somebody always asks about it. So for um, Ada Harris, she mm -hmm. asked about uh, lavender in Florida. How about Northwest Florida, just a few miles from South Alabama? It may work out there. You're going to be much closer to where lavender grows well. I think commercially it's grown in like Oregon. Yes. And that would be it's way out west. Oregon. Yeah. So yeah. Central Florida is nothing like Oregon. 
But you know, you could you should probably try that up in Northwest Florida, Alabama, even Georgia. The further north you go, the greater chance of success with it. Just know it's going to be an experiment. Yes, and lavender suffers the most during summer, especially in the southern United States where it tends to be wet, hot, and humid. That lavender hates that. It hates the hot, humid, raining a lot kind of weather in the summer. Right. That's what. That's why lavender does not do well here. Summer, it must like cool and humid stuff. though, because Oregon is cool, cool and humid. But you know, we're nothing like Oregon. So, mm -hmm. how about any thoughts on growing garlic in Florida? Yes, garlic can grow here. You have to grow it in the winter. You have to plant it in the fall, September or October, and let it grow all winter. And you could pick it now. I would guess March or April. It has to be, and don't um, don't hold me to this, look it up to double check, but in the world of garlic, you have hard neck garlic and soft neck garlic. You have to grow hard neck garlic here in Florida. Soft neck, I think will rot. Okay. So elephant garlic and hard neck garlic, and I might have that reversed, grows in Florida. But How about yeah, Sarah Dan? Elephant Saranam cherries, wouldn't that be more of a South Florida thing? No, they grow no? here in Central Florida. They grow here? Okay. So I'm going to say they just haven't seen them like they did when they were kids. You don't see them very often. It's not commonly planted and it's really underused in the landscape. That would be a fantastic choice for uh, a landscape bush to replace an oleander or what are the Ligustrum in people's yards. Nothing personal. I just don't like ligustrums. So <laughs> pull up the ligustrum, put it in a Suriname cherry. It can grow into a fairly large, attractive, very tight green bush. So your neighbors in your HOA will never question it. They'll wonder, but they won't question it. And it flowers and Suriname cherries, I think, are the little red berries that are shaped like a pumpkin. They're like ridged. And they're kind of sour, but you can eat them and they're very good for you too. High in vitamin C. Okay. Um, there's a question about um, can mushrooms be grown in South Florida? I know there was a group of people growing. Oh, some <laughs> just lost was Hitachi or something like that. Mushrooms. Yeah. Here in Hernando. You can um, buy the kits with the inoculated log or piece of wood which you can do indoors anywhere, really. Oh. Mushrooms, if you're trying to gather them from out in the wild, we discourage that because you have to know for sure what it is and that it's not poisonous. And I won't make that recommendation to you. No. I send that to our mushroom expert at the University of Florida because I would not want to tell you it's safe to eat and then find out later that it wasn't safe to eat. But the mushroom kits, you can you can do that anywhere in the country. You're doing that indoors mostly. Okay. And two more two more questions because I have to run real quick. Suriname cherry may be invasive in South Florida. You probably have to double check that and look that up. To the best of my knowledge, it's not invasive here in Central Florida because it's going to freeze back a little bit, and that keeps it restrained. It keeps it well behaved. Other plants in South Florida, they're not well behaved. They grow year round and they become invasive. And what to use on leaf miners? Use spinosad, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. And you can find that online. You can buy it on Amazon. You should be able to find it at the big box stores, but find a, a form or a brand of spinosad that will organically control leaf miners. Neem oil will not work because the leaf miner is inside the leaf. The neem oil sits on the outside and the two never meet. Spinosad is organic. It's made from a, a naturally occurring bacteria. It goes in the leaf and works very, very well on leaf miners. And it's really the only thing that works well on leaf miners. And wait, one more thing. What's your Facebook page? Oh, our Facebook page, the short name for it on Facebook is Hernando EXT.
That's short okay. for Hernando extension. Okay. So if you go on Facebook, go to the little search bar, Hernando EXT, you're going to find us. Look under videos because we have so many different classes. You know, we have a couple of years worth of classes at this point. Yeah. All saved on Facebook and you just scroll, scroll, scroll and watch. Especially the past year. We've both been just putting out <laughs> tons of videos. A lot this past year and a lot, it seems like just recently. Because for example, I have to run and go yes. to the office and do another class at noon. So Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time and your expertise. And thank um, you, Lily, and thank you, everybody. I'll see you all yeah, later. I have a few more slides, um, but we'll say goodbye to Dr. Lester. <laughs> Here is um, what I've left up, these uh, resources that you can find from the University of Florida. And as I said, if you email me at lilyb at hernandocounty.us um, and ask for a PDF of this, you'll have all of this in writing. Here's our upcoming classes that we have going on. Tomorrow, um, because Dr. Lester is so busy, um, I will be hosting the virtual plant clinic. You can find that at his Hernando EXT Facebook page. I'll be hosting the virtual plant clinic and I'm bringing a couple of buddies from my past um, who still work with County Extension, and we're going to have, I think, a lot of fun, and they'll be able to answer a lot of questions for you. Now, I mentioned that rain barrels are not um, great to use on vegetable gardens, but if you are interested in attending a rain barrel workshop and or a compost bin workshop, we have one um, combination workshop this month, not this month, I'm sorry, in April. And then another that is just rain barrels. The first one that is the combo class um, will be held on Zoom on a Thursday evening. And then you will pick up your barrel and compost bin. You can just get a compost bin if that's all you want. You can get just a barrel if that's all you want, or you can get both. Um, you'll pick those up the following Saturday at the Master Gardener Nursery. Now on April 21st, we're actually gonna have an in-person, but it'll be an outdoor workshop at the Shinsega Conservation Center. That's a Wednesday at 9 a.m. It's not the Manor House, it is the Conservation Center. It's a little bit different. Rain barrels are $50. If you are a customer of Hernando County Utilities, um, you will receive a credit of $25 on your water bill one time just for your first rain barrel. And, but the compost bins are free to Hernando County residents. To find out more, because there's a lot more <laughs> to find out about these situations, again, email me at lilyb at hernandocounty.us and tell me which workshop you're interested in or if you would like a PDF of this presentation. We thank you all very much for joining Dr. Lester and I. Like I said, he had to run because he's such a busy guy, but I thank you all um, for joining us and we will see you again. Um, let me move back up. We're not going to have a Wednesday class next week. We're going to have a Tuesday class and that will be Dr. Lester and I again doing a part two on bugs that bite, sting, and taste you, but that'll be at 10 o'clock. Thank you everyone and have a really good week.